You're listening to the We Are Libertarians podcast network. Find all of our shows at wearelibertarians.com. Welcome to the Chris Spangle Show. My name is Chris Spangle. It's so great to be with you today. And I am excited to have on the program for the first time someone that I wanted to talk to forever, somebody that I love following on Twitter at slash Hannah Cox 7. She's the senior national manager for conservatives concerned about the death penalty and the host of the based podcast. It is the great Hannah Cox, who is Hannah, you're just one of my favorite people to follow. You write at fee, uh, you you really nail it and I, I love everything you write. So thank you so much for uh, you consistently put out. You're just punching libertarians, conservatives, and Democrats in the nose. I love it. <laughs> well, thanks so much, Chris. I love following you as well and appreciate your advocacy and and having you in my corner because um, I do I do punch squarely and um, I don't hold back against any particular party. So it can it can infuriate people across the spectrum. But um, but look, you know, I think if we want to be serious, if we want to be effective, we've got to hold our own accountable as much as the other guys. So that's one consistent message that I have and why I mean, it can be uncomfortable. Like I like Rand Paul, I vehemently disagree with everything he said on George Stephanopoulos this past weekend, you know, but that's one time where you've got to go, he's wrong on this, he's right on this, he's right on that. I mean, and that comes with a lot of criticism in the DMs. I mean, why do you do it? I mean, you could just go along to get along and promote all your causes. Why do you want to hold people accountable on your own side? Yeah, well, you know, I had the benefit of getting into politics sort of in an abnormal way. I was in the music industry. I thought I was going to law school and kind of stumbled into politics on the side. Um, and I fell in love with it. But I also remember in my first role looking around and seeing a lot of people who were really in politics just to make a buck or who were there because they wanted their name um, up on TV or they wanted, you know, to have their face on TV. And and I just remember looking around and thinking, you know, there's a lot of things I could do. There's many things I'm passionate about. If I'm going to do this, this, it's going to be because I have something to say and because I think I have ideas that will help all people um, equally. I really believe in our founding documents and ideals. And I think that if applied consistently, we really could see tremendous and have seen, you know, tremendous wealth increase, tremendous life um, increases. And, and unfortunately, we, we see a downward trajectory of those ideals being applied and we see people being hurt because of it. So I, I do feel strongly um, about the direction I think the country should go in. And if I'm in it just to make a buck or have my face on TV, I need to get out because I think that's when you can start really doing more damage than good. Um, and and that's, that's something that I thought all along, but I had the benefit of being able to wait um, and continue working in music and wait for the right kind of opportunities to open up. So I was never really put in a situation where I felt like I had to sell out or like I had to go along with what my boss was saying. I was able to be very intentional about the kinds of jobs that I took and the sorts of places I would work um, and, and make sure that I was able to always be in positions where I could be really consistent and principled. And, and I think especially with the uh, evolvement of Trump and the GOP and what's happened with that. There's been a lot of people who didn't like the trajectory of, of where the GOP was going. They didn't agree with the things Trump was saying, but they were sort of boxed in and didn't feel like they could be as outspoken as they might would have liked to have. And I think that's a really detrimental, dangerous position to be in. So I, I strive really hard to be able to have an independent voice. Um, I try to be fair. I try to be consistent. That being said, you know, when you're in the public eye and you're constantly giving your opinion and you're weighing in on things across uh, various topics, you're going to mess up. You're not always going to be perfect. You're going to change your mind. You're going to evolve. And I think that um, I hope people give me that grace and I try to give other you know, leaders that I look up to that, that space and grace as well. One more question about courage, and then we'll talk about the death penalty. Um, you, you've posted a couple times recently that I think it's important for people to understand this concept that sometimes when you take a tough stance you lose a few people but you gain a lot more can you talk yeah. a little bit about that experience when you're talking about some in-group policing and and saying courageous things that might tick off your own side yeah absolutely and i think the best example of that i can give is is talking about systemic racism um i always say you know of all the things i talk about that's the number one thing i get the most pushback and and the most visceral type of tax for um, and I don't care because at the end of the day, I answer to me, I answer to God, and I answer to the people around me whose opinions I care about, my family and friends. 
And I would not be able to live with myself if I didn't stand up and speak out against that issue. And so it's never been a question in my mind of whether or not I would, but I will say when some of that backlash really start to um, come about last year, especially in the summer and, and fall, it was very intense, especially among libertarian circles. There was this uh, attempt to ostracize people who spoke about these issues and really force them out of movements. Um, it was intimidating, but I remember thinking, you know, I've got to stand strong in this because what I'm doing is not only doing the right thing, but it's going to speak volumes to people who are maybe on the peripheral looking in thinking, you know, I, I see the Democratic Party is broken. I see the Republican Party is broken. I, I'm interested in your ideas around free markets, but it seems like everybody in your camp is really OK with systemic racism. And, and so I really spoke out and, and led in that. And what I found was my DMs filled up with people that were in those positions with people, um, people of color who were saying, you know, you're the only conservative in my feed who's speaking about these things. You're the first libertarian I've ever seen talk about race. I wasn't sure I was open to libertarian ideas because I thought that a lot of the people were secretly racist, but I know that you're not. I see that you're talking about these things and that made me more open to other things you've had to say. Now I'm following you on this. Maybe I don't agree with you consistently, but I trust your voice. And, and I noticed that in my um, actual followings on social media, you know, I would have maybe four or five really vocal guys, always guys, just it's really men. upset. It's, it's always men. men. I'm such a misandrist it's after 20 years of moderating <laughs> online comments boards. Like, it's always men. I'm like, you guys need to go to therapy, honestly. Like, Women are in therapy. Take your butt to therapy. Right. Like, one lady in a MAGA hat may join <laughs> in who's, like, from the biker bar, but it's always men. Yeah. Yeah. Karen from the biker bar and then the men. <laughs> And, um, and they're very vocal and, and they're, and they're um, hostile. And, and so it can feel like, oh gosh, I'm going to lose all these followers. But you find that you don't lose that many followers. Actually, I find most of those people weren't following you to begin with. They're just kind of lurking on your page. And I always, 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 every time I speak out against them, every time I remove that kind of person from my page because of someone's being abusive towards me or um, towards others, I do remove them pretty quickly. I, I'm all for debate, but you need to be able to conduct yourself like an adult. And every time I do that, almost instantly, I'll pick up 50 to 100 followers. And um, and I think, you know, that's been my anecdotal experience. But you can look at things like the GOP, right? They didn't do a good job of pushing the crazies out, of pushing the fringe people out. And because of that, the people who were saying, the people who had good principles, the people who had good morals, they left. They've been out of that party for, you know, three, four years now. You've got some people that continued to vote Republican because they didn't feel like they had an option. But the base itself has corroded itself. And I think unless they were to actually take a stand and really start to say, this is not what we're about, we're not in support of these ideas, you're not going to see those people start to come back to the movement. Um, and that's that's ultimately going to be very harmful for them in the coming years. So I think that it's important for people to recognize you need to stand up for what's right because it's right. Um, even if you don't benefit from it, you need to stand up for what's right. But that being said, I think there's a old Billy Graham quote that I find to be very true that says when the uh, when a strong man takes a stand, the spines of others are stiffened. And I think that's absolutely true. And I think that you lead by example and, and people follow people um, who are courageous leaders and who aren't afraid to say what's right and wrong. I was literally going to mention that quote um, because it it I saw it last year at some point for the first time. And I had the same reaction to last year that you did, you know, and it, it being a part of the Pat Down podcast, talking to um, a black audience for the first time in my life, like having more black friends than I ever had in 98% white Plainfield, Indiana. Um, and, and getting to know them and to understand their experience and listening to them and understanding how different it, their experience is than mine was truly change. It changed me over the last couple of years. And then this past year, I've become more conservative in some ways because I believe more in institutions. Um, and you're right, I have nowhere to go. And, and so when I see somebody like you talking about race and systemic racism, and you're like one of four libertarians, you know, they're, they're kind of like a, a constitutional conservative leaning person like like you and myself, like it's just you sort of go, oh, OK, we're not alone. So I, I just really appreciate that. And I imagine that that stance has to come from your work at conservatives concerned about the death penalty. How much does that that view on systemic racism, how much is it informed by your work around the death penalty? 
Yeah, um, definitely informed, but I will say actually what really um, set me on the pathway I'm on was was much further back than that. And it was working in the entertainment industry. And shortly after I graduated, I was working for Entertainment One and I was working in the Nashville offices, which, you know, Entertainment One is a huge global company. But um, in the Nashville offices, we had some country labels, we had some uh, rock labels, and then we had a black gospel label. And so a lot of my colleagues were black and it was my first time kind of being in a, in an environment where I wasn't the majority um, ethnicity. And, and I, I think I used to have very commonplace ideas about racism and, and its existence and how it um, existed in the world, you know, in the modern world. And it wasn't until I was working there and actually it was around the time the Trayvon Martin case happened, which to me, that case was entirely about the second amendment. And I didn't see anything else, right? It was an attack on the Second Amendment. You were either for the Second Amendment or you were against it. And I saw it in these very like unnuanced ways. And it wasn't until that case came about and I was talking to my colleagues that, you know, they started talking to me about their experiences with police and their experiences in the world and um, how they feared for their kids, you know, and the conversations they had to have with their kids, how, how they could move through the world. And it was very different than, than my upbringing. And I think I was convicted at that point. And um, it made me start paying closer attention to the criminal justice system. And so I actually think that was a, um, a precluder to my actual job now. And so over the years from that point on, I, I slowly became more and more involved with the criminal justice system. And now I lead conservatives concerned. Um, and certainly within the death penalty, there is overt racial bias in the sentencing, in the victims whose crimes we solve and in which victims get the resources and which ones don't. Um, you know, throughout the system, it just courses and it's very pervasive. But um, I think that 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 really was what made me start paying attention to criminal justice in general was actually a lot further back. What were some of the statistics or things that persuaded you early on or still continue to inform this this view that stood out to you that you just went, wow, this is really unequal? Yeah, well, you know, I was very in favor of the death penalty growing up. I loved Law and Order SVU, and my dad's a Southern Baptist minister, so I was like, kill him. You know, I, was, I really was one of those types. And I was still working in the music industry, but I, I kind of knew I was going in the direction of being in politics full time. And I had taken a role with the National Alliance on Mental Illness, NAMI, doing some pro bono lobbying for them. And I was very passionate about finding free market solutions for mental health issues. I think so often in, in the free market limited government crowd, you know, we're always the no people and that's good. We need to be the no people. There's tons of bad ideas, but we don't then come up with other solutions to these really real and pressing problems in our society. And so I was trying to do that. And it was there that I was first asked to work on the death penalty. And I was like, you know, I was pro bono. So I could say yes or no to what I wanted to do. And I was like, yeah, no, I'm, I'm not with you on that one. Sorry. No, you can take that and Medicaid expansion over there. <laughs> um, and then they were like, but why you you hate the government <laughs> like you're the you're the token limited government person here why do you think they should you know carry out the death penalty and and it was it wasn't I didn't feel attacked in that moment it was kind of just their surprise how they took it that I was you know they they took it for granted that I wouldn't be in favor of the death penalty and I think the way they handled that just sort of made me go do I know what I'm talking about here? You know, do I actually have a reason to support the death penalty? Like maybe, maybe and I don't know what I'm talking about. the answer a firm no? <laughs> the answer was a firm no. I, I think I went home, I did about a weekend's worth of research into it. And I was just, everything I thought about it was wrong. You know, there's, I thought, I knew there'd been some innocence discovered. I had no idea the vast amounts. There's been one person exonerated for every nine executions in this country. And I got to tell you, exonerations like this really high bar, you can get out of jail for things like taking an Alfred plea or having your trial overturned or having it thrown out. To be exonerated, you essentially have to prove somebody else did it. So we've had far more wrongful convictions than just that. But one person for every nine has been exonerated. Um, that's pretty startling. When you really get down into the system of how it works, you know, I think most people think, well, we're, we're discovering those wrongful convictions. The system's working. That's proof the appellate process is working. It's actually not. The appellate process is not working. The appellate process is really just kind of going through like very procedurally checking boxes. You know, did they have an attorney? Check you know, these basic things, they're not looking to um, ensure they got the right person. In fact, they're working really hard to prevent any evidence that might overturn their case. And so that's why you'll see district attorneys and attorneys general frequently work to block new DNA evidence from being tested. They'll work to block new hearings. They'll work to block new testimony. It's actually very difficult to get a wrongful conviction 
through the system, it takes on average 10 years. Um, and typically when we find these wrongful convictions, it's not the government itself finding them, it's outside pro bono groups like the Innocence Project coming in and working. And so if you're lucky enough to get the Innocence Project, great. Maybe you have a, you have a chance to, to prove your innocence. If not, you probably are executed. And the reality is since I took over this organization, there's been at least one or two cases each year uh, where the person was executed that I firmly thought the evidence showed they were innocent. So that to me in and of itself, as a person who is a pro-life person who really believes in individual liberty and limited government, that alone was enough for me to say, nope, they shouldn't be able to do this. This this makes no sense. But then it just keeps getting worse. <laughs> like you dig in. Oh, and, really? Yeah. <laughs> oh, please. Just, All right. Yeah, that's the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, you know, it's not a deterrent. I think that was a that was a misconception that I had. I, I thought, well, if there's a death penalty, you know, that will make people not want to commit crimes. That, that's totally disconnected from the actual mentality and what we know about criminality. The, the number one deterrent to, cr to crime is actually an assurance that you'll be caught. And in this country, we only clear 60% of homicides on average across the country every year. So in some districts, that's down to like zero, 15%, 30%. If you commit murder in this country, your odds of getting away with it are like pretty decent. If you commit lesser crimes in this country, you've got an even better shot. We're really, really bad at solving crimes. And so that in and of itself, um, I think precludes the death penalty from being a deterrent. But also, again, it, it kind of ignores the mentality people commit crime in, right? They're either acting in a crime of passion, um, they're acting methodically and planning it out and therefore don't think they'll be caught, um, or they're acting in a state of um, mental duress. And, and that's typically who you find on death row is people with very severe mental illnesses, people who have intellectual disabilities, people who have severe traumatic backgrounds to the extent that it has interfered with their cognitive processes. Um, and, and really, you know, it comes down to the location where the crime was committed, a defendant's socioeconomic status and ability to participate in their own defense and the race of the victim. And those are the, the main things that actually determine who gets the death penalty in this country and who does not. It has very little to do with the nature of the crime. Um, in fact, you can look at you know state populations and you can see on their death row and in their life, maybe even not life with, without parole populations, identical crimes just committed counties apart. And in one county, they'll get the death penalty because it's a high usage county and the rest they won't. So it's highly arbitrary, not a deterrent, huge opportunity cost because it's the most expensive part of the criminal justice system on a per offender basis. So we're spending millions and millions of dollars more on death penalty cases than it takes to have life in prison without parole. We're not getting a deterrent for that. That's money that should be going to things that actually could work to deter crime or on solving more crimes or on victim services, which we also do a really bad job at. Yeah, that I, I think back on this and I just, when I was a baby Republican, I, I started to kind of think that the death penalty might be wrong because it costs more to fight all the appeals than to house them in prison. And now I look back and I'm like, what a heartless like way to think about it. Like you're thinking about your own pocketbook instead of like a life, a human being. Uh, and I mean, that, that, that disparity between counties, is it just a prosecutor in a county pushes this because that's the nature of the county or maybe they have like a, they want to look tough on crime for a future election. Like, do we have any idea why there's that disparity between different jurisdictions like that? Yeah, we do. We see that it's only 2% of counties that bring the majority of cases, and it is solely up to the district attorney. The vast majority of district attorneys in this country have recognized that it's far too expensive. It's a huge time sap. You know, the, the, re, the re, reason it's so expensive, the appellate process is only a part of it, but actually the trial is about four times more expensive than the appellate process. 70% of the costs come from the trial alone. And so just from the time they put it on the table, that, that money starts ticking upwards, whether or not the jury goes for it, which since 2000, more often than not, they do not. We've seen new death sentences collapse 60%. Um, now that juries have options like life in prison without parole, we see that they're picking alternatives to the death penalty. And so um, a lot of prosecutors have just recognized it's not worth the time or money. Um, and they are trying to be more effective in actually solving and processing more crimes. The ones that you do tend to see pursue it, pursue it over and over and over again. They're typically in larger, richer counties, and they're usually ladder climbers. These are usually people that are then going to go run for AG and then for governor and then for you know Senate. People like Kamala Harris, people like Joshua Hawley. This is, this is their fast track to get their name in the news and move on up. So um, it really is a very small proportion of them. It's I, I think since reinstatement, we've had less than 16% of counties carry out an execution. 
Wow. Okay. So, so you said 2% of counties, is that nationwide? So I, know that, yes. I think it's like 3,500 counties, only 2% of counties actually ever pursue the death penalty. Not ever, but 2% bring the majority of the cases. Oh, so okay. you might have a one-off here and there, but most of the cases are coming from those 2%. Where are those states? What states are they? Well, we're down to only 25 states that still have it. Um, 22 have repealed it legislatively, and then three others have moratoriums on executions. Of the 25 that still have it, over a third of those have not carried out an execution in a decade or more. So you're down to like eight to 10 states that are still actively carrying out executions um, in a given year that's always about seven or eight total. Uh, I think last year was six and, and they're who you think they are. You know, it's Texas, yeah. it's Alabama, it's Mississippi. It's these same places where you always had pretty overt racial issues. And then you look at what's happening in their death penalty system. And they're usually carrying out these executions either against black defendants or um, um, on white defendants who are poor, who have mental illnesses, things of that nature. But the number one combination for a case on death row is a black defendant with a white victim. Hmm. Okay. And that's, so, and that's not, that's not a leading statistic in the homicide rates. So most crime is, is ethnicity on ethnicity. So white on white, black on black, et cetera. So sure. it, it's a very small percentage of the population that where you would have a black defendant and a white victim, yet that is the leading combination on death row. So as you go around trying to convince people, especially conservatives, um, uh, that this is an immoral and utilitarian wise, it's not effective, uh, that this is just a, a, a tool that ought to be laid down and put aside. Why, where, what communities are most receptive? But when you go into an Alabama, a Texas, uh, you know, Mississippi, like, What's your strategy? Is it just like talking to a brick wall? Why do you find such a resistance there to listen? Yeah, I, I don't find that actually. We've seen a really huge growth in the number of Republicans who are not only in favor of getting rid of it, but who are actually leading the charge. Um, this year and for the past three or four years, we've had 10 or 11 states that have actually had Republican sponsored bills to repeal the death penalty. Close to 60 lawmakers have signed on across those as sponsors and then you know dozens to hundreds of others have voted in favor. So we really do see a tremendous shift in Republicans at the state level on this. Um, the Trump administration was wildly out of step and kind of an outlier in that community. Um, but, you know, in, in places like Ohio and Wyoming, they're, they're looking at moving bills in the next year or two. Places like Texas or Alabama that are still carrying out executions all the time. Um, and by all the time, I want to point out, even those have really decreased the number they're carrying out. We've been well under 30 executions every year for the past six years. So um, even when they do and they are higher usage states, they're maybe carrying out two, three um, a year. It used to be, you know, dozens. So even those states have decreased. And what I find is that there's a lot of people who are ready to have that conversation on the right. Um, they especially like to talk with us because I think we're one of the only groups on the right that's working on this issue. And so I think there's a comfort level in being able to connect with people who you know share your ideology in other areas and, and will shoot straight with you. Um, but my, my talking points, I guess, are never really around the morality of the death penalty. I don't, I don't really feel like you can be the person to come in and tell somebody their views are immoral. Even if, even if they are, I don't think that typically is something that moves people. Instead, I really like to approach it from the practicality standpoint, because when I changed my mind on it, I don't think I went into, oh, this is immoral overnight. I went into, well, this is terrifying and very broken and needs to stop, right? Like, and and right. then maybe a couple of years after I worked around the system longer, and got to know more of the people up close, got to know the victims' families that it, it hurt. We, you know, we have tons of victims' family members we work with who are opposed to this. Um, and then also working with Exonerees reason, even working with people on death rows who are guilty, but seeing you know, the potential for redemption in them and seeing the changes that they can incur over the time they've been incarcerated, it, it humanizes the system in a way that I think most people don't have um, that insight to when they're commenting on it. But it, it took a while for me to get to that place of saying like, no, this is also wrong in theory, right? For the longest time, I'd be like, well, I'm not really opposed to it in theory, but it definitely needs to go in practice. So I think you just need to help people down that pathway. Um, I often tell people, you know, the reason that we're winning is all of the data is on our side. There is no good argument for keeping the death penalty. We have one opponent, which is the district attorney's com um, conferences that want to keep their power. They'll argue against any kind of criminal justice reform. And, and when they come in, you know, they're really grasping for straws. They'll come in and say, oh, we need this to get plea deals out of some out of people. You know, we need it as a bargaining chip. Um, well, plea deals lead to wrongful convictions all the time. And you need to quit using that as something to hang over people's head. It's what you need to do and actually take your cases to trial and prove your case, which the state doesn't do very often anymore. Um, so as a whole, you know, I think that we'll continue to win. It's really more of a question of capacity and just getting all the facts in front of people. 
Well, I know you're having success, but I've heard the opposite. Shouting at someone, telling them they're immoral works all of the time. <laughs> it's the best way to change people's hearts and minds, Hannah. Uh, so you mentioned the Trump administration and them being wildly out of step. Can you talk about what happened at the end of the Trump administration with death, the death penalty? Yeah, it got weird. Um, so two years ago, <laughs> it's like it, they I, I think really that, that could... like, like three and a half years. And then he just went, all right, I've got to be me. <laughs> like, and, <then> just, <laughs> and it was just, oh, my great impression. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we got word in 2019 that he was trying to restart the death penalty. There had not been a federal execution in 16 years at that point. Um, and they didn't, they didn't really have the drugs that they needed. And so there was this huge battle for about the next year of whether or not they'd be able to get uh, the courts to agree to their processes that they had. And the reason they didn't have the drugs, which most people aren't aware of, all of the pharmaceutical companies, period, all of them have put clauses in their contracts that say you cannot use our medicines to kill people. <laughs> so, right. so they're having trouble getting these drugs and states go through all kinds of subterfuge and try to do all kinds of illegal things to obtain it. Um, that's another story for another day. But anyway, so the federal government was doing that. It held everything up for a year. Finally, this past summer, um, those issues worked their way through the court. And there was a number of people who had exhausted their appeals and they were able to proceed with a string of executions. He ended up killing more people in under a year than all presidents for the past 67 years combined. Wow. So he went on a massive killing spree. Um, and it was the first time we'd had federal executions in 17 years. And every single person that was executed during that time span was someone who had very, very severe mental illnesses. I'm, I mean, schizophrenia, I mean, bipolar disorder, psychosis. I think people often understand the difference in like your rank and file mental illness and your severe mental illness, which is a difference in the classification in the DSM. Um, but it usually pertains to some kind of psychosis where this person does not have the same cognitive functions as, as you or I would have. Uh, or they had intellectual disabilities, or they had very, you know, serious traumatic backgrounds, like the woman that he killed, Lisa Montgomery, reading her case file was horrific. It was one of the hardest ones I've ever had to read. She was um, sex trafficked from a very young age by her mother. She was gang raped. She was sold for sex. Um, she was beaten by her mother. I think when she was like 18, 19, she married a relative, had five kids. I mean, this was a woman whose background was so brutal she'd been telling um she told a male cousin who was a cop that she was being abused she told um, people in court that she was being abused when her mother was going through divorce nobody came in to save her her rescue her it was just this colossal failure of all public services in her life she was locked in like a shack on the side of her trailer where she was kept and urinated on i mean just heinous heinous ab abuse and what she did she did carry out a heinous crime as well but you can really look at this pattern in her life and see where she snapped. And I don't think she was all there anymore when she did this. Um, and so those were the kind of people he was killing. And it was just this very uh, weird, bizarre um, action. It, it didn't seem, I think he thought it might stir his base. I don't, I think he was very out of touch with where Republicans are on this issue and where they've been moving. Like maybe in the 19. 90s this is where republicans were these days as we've moved into the age of information as we've elevated in our um intelligence and in our information around how the brain works and, and around these illnesses i think most people were really left scratching their heads it was a very odd action for him to take what is that shift is it are we in some ways and i know it feels so weird to say this but i've been asking people this a lot lately are we becoming a more empathetic society like are we becoming more aware of the dignity of people and talking about you know when when we were kids like if you were a criminal you were a criminal and who cares what happened to you right like but now i think people have a much different view of these things like is is that a factor like what is that shift that's happening in republicans that they're rethinking this issue yeah, I do. I don't know if I want to say we're becoming more empathetic because I, I don't know if that feels true. <laughs> At least not this month, it doesn't. <laughs> but, um, but I think we're becoming more informed. And I think that we are developing an understanding of how the human brain works, of what impacts it. Um, I think, you know, even in the 90s, things like talking about mental health were really taboo. And now it's very commonplace. And it's seen as something, you know, you go and you get mental health care. And of course, you address these things. And we've, we've come such a long way. But I've been reading this book called The Body Keeps the Score 
which I encourage anybody to read that's about how trauma actually impacts the mind. Um, and it's, it's so fascinating to read because the author was a psychiatrist who was working his way um, and doing his research, you know, through the 70s and 80s. And if you see where we were then, as he's talking about the treatments that we had and our understanding of things then versus even where we are now, we've made leaps and bounds in recent decades in our understanding, but we still have so far to go. You know, we're really not that advanced when it comes to the brain and when it comes to um, cognitive functions and mentalities and how things impact and, and how much decision-making power we each actually have, you know, and things of this nature. I think all of it's still pretty cutting edge and new to most people, but just with that little bit of evolvement and understanding, I do think we're understanding better why people commit crime um, and therefore how we could prevent it how we could actually treat it. Um, seeing violence more as a public health issue versus an uh, act of criminality, I think is a wise way to go where we could start actually investing in treatments for people um, and trying to intervene early on because we're, we're really learning ways to test and identify uh, triggers and different measurements that could indicate a person could have a propensity for violence moving forward. And so I think as we're, as we're just gaining an information, we understand better why people commit crime. And I think that narrative has been very powerful that shift in the narrative has been very powerful because in the 90s and before that like you said if you were a criminal you were just bad you were just unreachable you know you were we used all this dehumanizing language you were a monster and there was no way to fix you and now oh. we know that that's not that's not true you know there's a lot of things we could be doing and actually our system has had responses that clamp down on those on those effects and actually compound them and make them worse whereas we could have uh, approaches to criminality and violence that work to heal well, this seems encouraging. Like, what's happening? A libertarian podcast that had, like, an encouraging, like, things may be getting better on an issue. I mean, it sounds like there's reasons for hope, Hannah. I think there are. Um, I think that, you know, the criminal justice reform is, like, the one issue the country kind of agrees on right now. So there's, <laughs> right. hopefully we can move forward on that. And you know what? If we can get that done, I think we'll be a whole lot better than we were, no matter what else happens. If people want to learn more about the death penalty and why it doesn't work or it's immoral or any any number of issues, where should they visit? Do you have books that you recommend, documentaries? Like what, what are some good starting points for people? Yeah, so they can check out our website, which is conservativesconcern.org. We have all kinds of information on there. I also love to recommend the Death Penalty Information Center. It's a nonpartisan, unbiased group. They actually don't even take a stance on the death penalty, but they have accumulated a wide span of data around various issues within it. So I think that's a good place to look. Um, I think, you know, the book Just Mercy and movie um, that followed it have been very popular with people. And I think that that does do a good job of letting people kind of see a little bit deeper into the system and how it functions. Um, but I, for me, I think, you know, the data doesn't lie. And so I always encourage people to go there first. Anna Cox, Senior National Manager, Conservatives Concerned About the Death Penalty. Their website, again, is conservatives ugh, conservativesconcern.org. Sorry, it's not your website. I've had a long day. And make <laughs> sure you check out Hannah's great podcast, Based. Uh, I imagine you can find that Anywhere where podcasts are downloaded, video series too. You've got a great setup, another old-timey radio in, in the podcast sphere. It's always great to have another one. Uh, where can people listen to your podcast? Yeah, it's based with Hannah Cox, and it's available on YouTube, Facebook, iTunes, and Spotify. So I would love for people to check me out. And again, her Twitter is at Hannah Cox 7 Hannah, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks, Chris. Enjoyed it. Thanks for listening to The Chris Spangle Show. We'll see you again tomorrow.